Dr. Amanda Hansen, welcome, my love. Thank you so much for having me and reaching out. I'm honored that you said yes. Honestly, TikTok knows I love empowered women, empowering women, and it brought you onto my For You page. And let me tell you, it was love at first sight. <laughs> Thank you so much. I do think that we need more of these kinds of collaborations where women who are rising are rising arm and arm together. It's a firm belief of mine. Oh, I love it. Like I have a lot of isms, a lot of little things I say. And one of them is let's do this. Mm, let's do this. Mm, oh. Yes, yes. yes. Oh, so I'm feeling the spirit animal kinship going on right now. The post that I saw, the TikTok that I saw, and I went and looked at some more and I was like, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Was you talking about your hair going gray yes. and empowering yourself with that? And I love that so much. Thank you. You know, for me, it was just this decision of, I was already raising a daughter at that time who was, she's 19 now. So early teens and already watching her kind of struggle and understand how to navigate this really toxic beauty culture. I am all for looking and feeling beautiful, but I am also for this message of loving who we are naturally. I love the idea, like, yes, if we want to enhance and we want to put on makeup or do certain things, but I'm not a stand for a culture that tells women, particularly in midlife, that they are no longer worthy, that they are now disposable. So for me, as I was watching my teenage daughter really come into her own and start to decide which messaging she was going to anchor into, I thought, well, I cannot actually stand here as a mother and encourage one thing for her and then do something totally different because she's actually watching how I live, mm -hmm. not what I say. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that was really the beginning of, okay, Amanda, what kind of midlife woman do you want to be? Yes. Uh, leading by example, hundred percent. And I'm, I'm with you on the aging, not aging gracefully, aging with grace. Mm, yes. And defining it however we want, like to each his her own. I want every woman to do what makes her feel fabulous and amazing. And what's fascinating about that video that went viral is I would say 98% of people were like, yes, this is amazing. This is iconic. You are a leader in the industry. Thank you. I had so many young women reach out to me and say, we need someone to watch. We need someone to lead us. We need someone to show us a different way. And then and as always on anything, right? There's that small percentage who says, well, stop shaming women who aren't. And I think that it's hard for some women to digest the idea that a woman can claim so proudly something so opposite, a machine, this huge machine that is running to try to get us to constantly open our bags and spend more money. And I think it's, it's very counter for some people's nervous system. So you see someone doing something opposite and I, I think it's so, so much equilibrium comes in. We want to make the person doing the thing different wrong. So people somehow heard that I was shaming them in that message, which couldn't have been further from what I was doing. I was sharing my story and my experience. Yes. Um, and, and I, I, people have a strong reaction to anything that isn't their wheelhouse, their decisions. Like I talk about a no kissing for three months dating role. And I have people who say, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I completely understand what it is that you're saying. My husband went out for coffee with an old high school friend. And I said, I'm going to say something controversial. I was okay with that because I trust my husband. I chose the right partner. And there are people like, oh no, he's cheating on you because they themselves can't conceptualize trusting somebody or even accepting that they could be loved so much that it wouldn't even cross their partner's mind. Yes. And how about even a step further that if the partner went out and had coffee with an ex and decided when they came home that they were leaving you for the ex, how about, and that gets to be okay too. Yes. And I said that I'm like, I don't <laughs> know somebody who doesn't want to be with me. <laughs> this idea of like so much control. And I also think going gray, that's part of what this symbolizes is this wildness, this aliveness, this primal connection with what really is. 
what, what truly lives beneath what we're trying to cover up and hide from. And I'm like, there is nothing to hide. This is a celebration. This is beautiful. But you make a really good point too, about how our culture, our beauty culture is literally poisonous to us, right? You talk about how the dye that you put on your head is poisoning your brain. I talk about not doing Botox anymore since my four, well, I am, I am 49. When I, when did I stop doing Botox again? I don't know. It's been a really long time. But look, see my, my forehead moves. And the reason why is because I did research when I was taught, when I was writing my books and I was writing about the chemical reactions that happen inside of us and what causes those chemical reactions. You know, um, dopamine is the reward chemical, but that's released by the muscles here, crinkling up, sending a signal to the brain that a reward happened. And I was depressed when I found this out. And I was like, damn, am I making myself feel worse by inhibiting dopamine production in my own brain? And crazy enough, the guy who took Botox from medical for migraines into cosmetic for wrinkles, uh, offed himself, uh, because he was so miserable, so, and his face was like, not a single wrinkle, right? But what was he doing to himself? Oh, I love that you bring this point up. We are soul sisters. Oh my gosh. These conversations, all I'm curious about when I speak to people is, and, and listen, I work with women in mid in many spaces, but primarily the midlife space, really reclaiming and like figuring out who they are for the second chapter, whether it's in sensuality, sexuality, marriage, all, all the things. But occasionally they will say, can I ask you about your journey to not doing Botox and to not coloring your hair? Can I ask you? I'm like, of course you can ask me. And then after working with me for six months to a year, nine times out of 10, they just naturally, not because I ever suggested, but they naturally are just watching me live, watching the expressions on my face. And they decide to opt in to more freedom because there's actually more freedom there than the face that is always frozen. And I really, truly, I feel that there, I feel we are robbing this beautiful rite of passage into this time in our lives. It feels so sacred to me. And I want to see her every morning in the mirror. I don't, I'm going to be 50. I don't need to look like I'm 30. I was 30. Let the 30 year olds be 30. That's, I feel so strongly about seeing who's waiting for me in the mirror every morning when I wake up. And, and this beautiful comment about like, like your husband's hesitancy of like seeing the switch over, like, are you sure? And, and then, and then one day he's just like, walk ahead of me because the way the sun is shining on the silver in your hair is so beautiful. So this transition from, and again, this is a cultural norm that's affecting what we think. And so, you know, we're, we're like, Oh, how can you age? Like you shouldn't have to stay young forever. How can you change? How can you let, let yourself go? Right. How can Mm -hmm. you let yourself go when really what you're doing is evolving into your womanhood and for him to recognize that, to see that and to find it beautiful. I think we all need to pay attention. Mm, Thank you for saying that. I love that so much. And I think he too was conditioned to believe that women don't let their hair go gray. I know he's very high profile. Everyone in his world is beautiful. It was this idea of like, well, any woman who is aging doesn't show her gray hair, doesn't show tiredness or lines on her face. Well, he didn't use those words. I think there was an unspoken expectation that I would continue to look like this you know, this wife who, who maintained a certain look about her, if you will. And because I am six years younger than him, I thought, you know, the conversation went on further. And I I said to him, I find it so fascinating that you didn't even entering midlife wasn't even a thought for you. And it is this brutal thing for women to come into and all these things about hiding and maintaining and the amount of money and hours per week. I want to opt out. I don't want it. I don't want to do it. And we had these amazing conversations about the double standards in aging. He's like, oh my God, you're right, Amanda. I've not even thought about it for a minute. I'm like, let me break it down for you. What it would entail if I too were to get on that train. Let me explain to you. 
I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it for the time, resources of time, not because of money and not because of the chemicals. I'm not, and for the spiritual holy aspect, I want to age. I want to see what happens because men are revered for aging. They're celebrated. They're called like, you know, these distinguished silver foxes. And we as women, we are punished. God forbid we've had another birthday. Yeah. Um, But let's just be honest here. These anti-aging methods don't make us look better in the long run. No, No. they don't. And yet women are targeted. Like I haven't done my nails. And so I haven't done, I used to be a stripper. I haven't done my nails. I have a full. Oh, I love you. Nine years in my bedroom. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Oh my God. Um, haven't done my nails since I quit stripping, right? Like the time, the money that you save. Um, and, and seriously, marketers, these, these companies know who's the spender in the household. Who is the spender? It's us. And so they target us. Empty your pocket, ladies. Buy these creams. Get the Botox. And sister, don't you feel like that's why it's we're on the struggle bus for so many decades for women? They're saying it's going to be 257 years before we even catch up to men in financial status and in investments and in wealth, because we can't build legacies or build businesses when we have a certain amount of dollars to use. And the decision becomes like, well, after my Botox, my nails, my eyebrows, my bikini waxing, my whatever else, add it to the list. Don't forget the booby lift and the, and the liposuction and the tummy tuck. And the, the BBL now, the, the yeah. Brazilian, all the things. By the time all of those things are added up and said and done, it's like, where's the time? Where's the money? And so when women say, oh, it's so exhausting. It's so hard. I, I say right back. And the, as long as we continue to open our pocketbooks, there's no one to blame. Yeah. Like we are the ones creating the machine. Mm-hmm. 83% of consumers are women. Yeah. And it's funny, everywhere I go, my husband and I laugh all the time. I get stopped constantly, whether I'm with him alone, with girlfriends, with my, my adult children, constantly by men are like, oh my God, your hair is so beautiful. Women rarely, because I think it like on some level, I don't know if it threatens the status quo, if it's like, oh my God, how could she, or, oh, she looks terrible, but it's really fascinating that it's men who, who say, my, just in passing, right? Like your hair is amazing. Oh my gosh. It's so beautiful because I just don't think we see enough of it. Yeah. And I really think that we discredit men's ability to love us as we are. Hmm. When, when we buy into this anti-aging culture and we do all these things to ourselves, we, we don't acknowledge that men fall in love with us and Hmm. freeze frame us. And they always see us as the beautiful woman. And and listen, listen, my husband was not attractive to me, but then I put on those love goggles and I went, damn, you're fucking sexy. (laughs) Right. And so like, that's what love does is it freezes people to you. My husband is aging. I'm aging. Do you think we see that in each other? No. What we see is the human being who is so attractive, so sexy, so beautiful. Oh my gosh. And you see the history, you see all the things you've built together. You see the struggles, you see the stories, you see the things that you know about them that nobody else knows. You, you know, the things that make them sad, that break their heart, that they go to bed worried about you. Those, that is the intimacy. I don't think I, I really want to break this down. I'm so happy we're having this conversation. I really, truly don't believe men want to be married to Barbie dolls. I don't believe they want to be married to some form of perfection because I also, I I have a very strong belief system around if we are so fixated on that, and I am starting to see some correlations. A lot of women who present like they have to be perfect in all the ways all the time are also the women who are struggling in the bedroom the most. Ah, the insecurity. Because you can't actually really and truly open yourself and be in that kind of vulnerability, that kind of rawness, that kind of animalistic expression when you are constantly in a performance. When you are performing here, you can't get real raw there. Yeah. Um, I wonder if they do it with the lights on. Oh, 
<laughs> oh, I'd love, to know. I'd love to know. Probably, probably the concern, right? Of like, oh, because if, if this all has to look a certain way, what happens on the night where something doesn't feel completely perfect? It's like, oh my gosh, just the rawness, the humanity, the two people coming together, sharing an experience rather than like someone needing to be a performance, a perfection. And I, I see people too, like individuals. I think it has everything to do with how we frame it. I see humans as works of art. Every single human being is their own beautiful piece of art. And that's what I find so interesting. The tapestry, the different lines, the different colors, the different memories etched on our skin. That's what I love. I gravitate towards people who are really in the rawness and their humanity. I love that you, you just use the term performance of perfection, because it, it kind of, it brings me to the women who stand in front of the mirror and, and do the makeup. And, and I, I'm not dissing this, mm-hmm. the makeup that's like, you know, the highlight here and the contour here, and it's just, and staying like it's hours, it's an hour to do like the full face. Um, there's so many products to use. There's so many colors to apply and you're just, you're, you're, you know, you're defining your nose and your cheeks and your chin and your neck and all this. And so you're creating a facade of perfection. And what I liked, and again, think of all the time and all the money that's invested in that. And, and there's part of me, and I'm going to make a couple points here, but there's part of me that's like, uh, how secure is she with herself when the makeup comes off and he sees, oh. right? Because, because that performance of perfection, when you show up for the first date, the second, the third, the fourth, and, and then all the makeup comes off, like, are you feeling like he is like falling in love with you? Or are you wondering if he's falling in love with the performance? And what I like to do, I don't wear foundation. I don't wear powder. I do eyes, cheeks, mouth. Thank you. You too. I love that. And eyes, cheeks, mouth. And my motto in the mirror is good enough. I yeah. walk away when I achieve good enough. I don't stay and look for flaws. I don't stay and look for things to fix. I just go good enough. And then off I go. And that's how I maintain my self-esteem by not looking at myself long enough to find things wrong with myself. I love that so much. I greet myself every morning as I'm coming for my toothbrush. Every morning I look at myself with presence and eye contact and I say, good morning, gorgeous. Yes. Oh, love you. Yeah. God damn miracle. I and love- I really presence that, you know, in my, in my nervous system, in my cells, I'm preparing myself before I go into the world with the those nervous messages. system and the cells. Oh, I love you so much because we alter our own DNA. We, we change our brain structure. We can change our DNA. <clears throat> I do the mirror work where I look at myself in the mirror. I say, I am beautiful. And I mm-hmm. look at myself in the eye. I bore into my own eyeballs and I say, I am beautiful. I drink my water And with every swallow, I am beautiful. I am young. I'm vital. I'm strong. I'm healthy. With every swallow is a mantra. And I put this into my body. Yes, because water is a living, it's an energy, right? And we are comprised of 80% water. So as you say these beautiful things, as you bring it into your body, you are literally like recoding, reprogramming everything that the outside world wants to tell or what maybe our mothers or grandmothers said to us. It's just, it's such a beautiful opportunity. And I really, I I think that as we go into this aging journey, we get to decide what we want to make it mean. And so I know so many women are like, it's so hard. I want to do it. I want to, I want to be more free. And we get to choose. You just literally have to decide like, oh, I get to choose that it gets to be beautiful. I get to decide because if, and I also say to women, if you allow yourself to just get a little bit angry, the anger is a really good motivator. And and what I mean by that is like, oh, I see what like capitalistic machine is trying to do. I see what consumer culture is trying to like, they're trying to hook me. They're trying to trick me again. I won't have it. I will not fall for it. What would you say this to a woman? Like, you know, you come across a woman you're having this conversation. She goes, but I'm scared. What would you say? I would ask her, what are you most scared of? Like, what are you scared? Because when I've heard 20 year olds say, well, I started getting Botox just for preventative reasons. And I say to them, Hmm, preventative of what? Mm -hmm. Because you're still going to age. 
you know, every one of us is a success. Actually, if we are aging, I would want to know what she's so scared of. Is she scared of living in a culture in a world? Cause I would bet this is it scared of being in a world and a culture that will think she's no longer worthy because we are so sickeningly youth obsessed. We leave no space for the woman in midlife. We, and, and I have some theories about why we don't as well um, is because she's so powerful. And typically a woman in midlife knows her fucking shit. She doesn't put up with things. And so I think it's harder to manipulate a woman in midlife. And so I think that is another reason why men are often drawn to the younger woman, because a woman in midlife and beyond, you can't get away with much with her because Mm -hmm. she... She just knows who she is. Um, So I think there's something to that too. But I've had friends say to me who are divorced, have said to me, they don't say it anymore. But when I first started on this journey, oh, well, Amanda, if you get divorced, you're going to color your hair and start doing Botox. And I said, I absolutely would not. And they're like, well, you're, you're just doing it now because you're married, you're secure. I'm like, no, hear me on this. If I get divorced and I'm somewhere and a man sees me from across the room with my gray hair, my sunspots and my wrinkles and says, I want to know her. That's the kind of man I'm an energetic match for. I am not an energetic match as an almost 50 year old woman for a man who expects me to look like I'm 35. I'm not interested in those men. I'm interested in a king who would come across the room and be like, I want to know you. Yeah. That's what I would be available for. I would never cover up and hide. And, And I also think it's such a, it's such a far reach for women who aren't living this way to even comprehend or understand the freedom that lives inside of this choice. Like I'm so damn free. It's like when I stopped eating gluten 15 years ago, because it made me so sick and I'd see cake or I'd see bread and people would be like, I'm so sorry. You can't have any. And I thought, Oh my, please enjoy it. Like I'm, I'm enjoying watching you enjoy it, but I can tell you the thought of me ingesting it, I will be doubled over in pain. So I don't look at that and wish I could have it in the same way. I don't look at women who do the Botox or color their hair and think, Oh, I wish I was doing it. Maybe I'll go back to it at all because I look at them and I think inside, thank God, thank God. I am so free. Thank yeah. God. I am so free. Um, and I, I can hear women in my head who, who would say, I don't want to not do the Botox because I'm dating. I'm single. I'm dating. I want to be as attractive as the women who are doing Botox. I, uh, you know, like it's, it's going to be, it's going to be no competition. I'm taking myself out of the competition if I develop wrinkles. And again, going back to the science of the brain, when you smile, your brain releases dopamine. But when I see you smile, my brain releases dopamine. And so you are keeping the other person from feeling a reward mm-hmm. by seeing you smile, by seeing that smile activate in your eyes. Yes, it is. It is actual emotional disconnect that is happening. I don't think people understand that. Yeah. Well, let's change it. Yes. The more we talk about it, right? I think it's just so important to have these conversations and to find other women who have also decided that they want to be on this journey as well. I agree. So Dr. Amanda Hansen, what is your doctorate? It's in clinical psychology. Look at you. I love this. I love this. Thank you so much. Yes. Over 20 years. And it was actually during COVID that I decided instead of doing the brick and mortar armchair therapy, I decided, well, I had to go online anyways to see clients. And while I was in that space, more and more women were saying to me, like, Amanda, would you put together some kind of group? Like I'm feeling so isolated. I'm feeling so alone in all of this. So I started, I didn't even know what zoom was. I figured out zoom. I started having these groups. And before you know it, women were saying, I don't want this to end. Can you keep offering more of these? And so I completely restructured my business, shut down my private practice, decided like, oh my gosh, now we have autonomy. We can live anywhere. I took my computer and now I I work with women all over the world, literally through my computer. How can women find these groups that you're hosting? The easiest, most direct way would be going to my website, which is just my name, Amanda Hanson, H-A-N-S-O-N.com. Yeah. And this is how they can find you in TikTok as well. Yes. They can find me at Midlife Muse, M-U-S-E. 
Yes. Oh, you are brilliant. I feel like there's a ton of stuff we can talk about. Um, who is your videographer, by the way? Because I see your TikToks and somebody's holding that camera for you. This is such a beautiful story. I actually was hosting a retreat in Miami in March and I interviewed, I, I do many different things where I bring people into the retreats for different aspects, like divine masculine energy for sacred ceremony um, between men and women. I do all these different levels and I have so much intention behind my work. I interview and interview until I find just the right people. So I was having a photographer come because these women had been on a six month journey with me and my mastermind. And I wanted a photographer that could capture the queen in them. And so when I was interviewing other female photographers, they were saying things like, so we'll bring hair and makeup crew. And I was like, no, 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 no. We're doing like raw, authentic, capturing the queen behind the eyes, like the soulfulness of every woman. And so as I was interviewing, I knew within minutes, like, no, next, next, next. So the, the photographer I ended up hiring within five minutes of our Zoom interview, we were both crying. Mm. I said, tell me what you see when you hold a camera. And I asked every woman this, when you hold a camera, what do you see on the other side? And when she started speaking, I was crying. She started crying. She came to my home. She photographed all of the women. And every time I would look over at her, I was video videographer myself for my own event during those moments as she was photographing these women, some who had a really hard time being in front of a camera on the other side of the camera, I would look over and I saw tears running down her face, the photographer's face. Wow. And I said, this is a spectacular human. I need to know her even deeper. So um, when I walked her out, um, she hugged me and said, that was one of the most powerful days of my life. Mm. And I said, it, it was one of the most powerful days of every one of those women's life because of the opportunity that you created for them. So she said, I don't know what you're doing in this work, but I've never felt that kind of energy from that many women who are so different in one room. I want to know you. We met for coffee a couple of uh, weeks later, and I told her what I, the path I was on, what I was doing. And she said, it's so much bigger than that. No, oh, I love it think bigger, go higher. And so I was like, okay. And so she said, I would be honored to be the one to, you know, create content with you for you work next to you. I'm so inspired. She's in her thirties and we have now, I mean, we are literally like the A team together. It's just absolute magic. It's so incredible. I'm so thankful that I was so intentional about how I found a photographer for the women in my group, because it then led to be the greatest gift for myself. I love this. I love this. Um, we are going to be chatting again. I would love this so much. Uh, what else should we talk about when we come back together and we have more conversations? Because I feel like there's so many layers to you. Mm, there are so many layers. We can talk about all the things. I would love to talk about, I mean, I have, there's so many things. I have a transgender child. I have a gay child. I have adopted. I have biological. I've been married 26 years, been with him 27 years. We can talk about how do we get through hard times in marriage? How do we maintain sexy sex in Ooh. long -term marriage? What does pole dancing actually mean for a woman who uh, brings a pole into her house? What is that art all about? Um, how do we infuse pleasure into everything we do all day long? How do we as women move in the world with feminine dominance? Uh, there's just so many beautiful things to talk about. Oh, sister. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love the world. I love the connections. I love how energy just comes and creates. And here we are creating goodness. I have, a, I have a mantra. This is, this is, you know, you, you talk about difficulties in marriage. My husband and I, we've been together for 17 years. We've known each other 19 years. We just had our 10th wedding anniversary. We fought for 10 years. We haven't had a fight in seven years. Hmm. And my husband says we had two good years <laughs> because, because like I was a dog trainer before I was a people trainer. And you, you know, when you, when you have to undo negative behaviors and get to good, you have to take the amount of time that things were bad divided by two. That's your reasonable expectation of change. And, and so it took five years to kind of really no longer feel. And I, and it was more on his part because I was meditating, really staying present in the moment. He was very traumatized by those 10 years of fighting as was I, but meditation helped heal my brain. 
And, and so um, it, it did take a long time for me to sense that he was, he fully let go of the past and was fully in how we were now. And, and so we have our battle wounds, we have our scars of, of those difficulties, but I am, I'm so rewarded by this relationship, rewarded by the fact that we stuck through it, rewarded by the goodness of the partner that I chose. But when we were transitioning from fighting to not fighting, you know, the brain says fight a clock because the brain cycles on patterns. And mm -hmm. so with fight, make up it a piece, fight, make up it a piece. And so even though I consciously stopped fighting, giving into that, the brain was saying fight a clock and we would get tense every month at five o'clock. And so those first three months were difficult because the brain kept saying five o'clock. And the way that I would get through it is say to myself, yes, goodness, thank you. I accept you. Mm -hmm. Because what we were creating at that time was extended periods of time without conflict. And that was different. And the brain goes, what the fuck when things get different and that, and I ha I'd have to get myself through those moments. Yes, goodness. Thank you. I accept you. Mm, that is so beautiful. There is an upper limit. I think for so many of us, we reach this space, like things are good and they're good. And it's almost like we have to sabotage it because we can't believe that it gets to be this good. I think at the human condition as we are trained, I think it's the way like we were, you know, primarily taking care of ourselves and, and the protecting ourselves is we're almost always looking for the other shoe to drop. Yeah. someone to betray us, someone to hurt us. I think we really have been conditioned to believe that it's only going to be so good for so long. You know, even that feeling when my husband and I were broke out of a similar pattern, it was finally good enough. It was almost like I couldn't even sustain the good enough because my body didn't know how to hold that much goodness for that long. Mm -hmm. So it was like, well, maybe I didn't think this consciously, but I think my body somewhere was like, well, then the next obvious thing is like, have a fight about something stupid to like relieve the pressure and be like, oh, okay. See, yeah, I knew it couldn't be that good. I, I knew it was a matter of time. You're so right. Relieve the pressure. It is a pressure. Um, it is. And we have those fights to pop the pressure and, and people say, oh, fighting is normal. Fighting is good because, you know, they disconnected and then they reconnect and they take that reconnect as a sign that their relationship got better. But it's because they disconnected that they feel better. We need to talk about that next. We need to talk about not fighting anymore next. Uh, let's let's do that. Oh, Amanda, like, why do I feel so close to you already? Like, it's just. <laughs> oh my God, where do you? Can can I ask you what city? Should I ask you offline what city you're in? Because I look at your background when you do your TikToks, and I'm like, that view is spectacular. Thank you. Well, that view will no longer be on the TikToks because I just moved. Um, that was in Miami. I'm in Fort Lauderdale now. <laughs> oh, I'm on my way to Fort Lauderdale, by the way. You are? All right. You, send me a DM. I will so send you a DM. Oh, uh, I love you. Oh, I love TikTok because it brings me just these incredible powerhouses. It's funny because my kids kept telling me for the past year, mom, you have to go on TikTok. I said, you guys, I am not going on to do dance videos because in my brain, I thought of TikTok as dance videos. And now that they've changed some of the you know structure around it, I'm like, okay, I could get behind that. I could go on there and give it a try. When I tell you, I posted that video on a Saturday evening. My husband and I, I don't know, we watched a movie or something, went to bed, didn't think much of it. We woke up the next morning. I'm like, Oh my gosh, what happened? And then that vulnerability comes. You're like, oh, should I take it down? This is craziness. But then I realized like, gosh, so many people needed to hear that message. It was just like a permission slip to free yourself from the chains if you so desire. Mm, the word permission. I love you because that's, I need, I need a permission to sparkle. Yeah. I, I need it. I need a permission to sparkle. And so, yes, and I get permission to leave what isn't serving them. Can I show you something? Please. This is my freedom bell. Oh. When, when I go live and, you know, because I teach no kissing for three months dating rules, selfish short-term thinkers versus generous long-term thinkers, leave what isn't serving you, level up. When women come on my live and they say, I love somebody because of you, I just left a toxic relationship, I go... Oh. And I ring the freedom bell for them. This is an antique Tibetan bell. And I ring it for them because they deserve to have a joyful celebration for the freedom they've chosen for themselves. Absolutely. I love that you're such a way shower. and so yeah. incredible. Amanda, thank you so much for joining me. Like I said, I'm so honored that you said yes.
Oh my gosh. Thank you so very much for taking the time to reach out, for having me to have this conversation with you. It's really been my honor and such a pleasure. Yes. Oh, thank you, my love. I'm going to talk to you again really soon. I look forward to it. Bye. Bye. Bye.